Yeah, thanks, Andrew. So um, it's good to be here. Um, I'm going to present a bit of background about the work that we're doing, and then Christina will give a bit more detail about QGIS and where that's all fitting in. Um, so Christina and I are both in CSIRO Agriculture and Food, and within that we're in a quite a small team which focuses on precision agriculture and viticulture. So this is a much more applied talk than to what we've had before. Um, so precision viticulture and agriculture, what is that? Um, under the assumption that land is variable, so in any vineyard or paddock, um, yields and quality of the crop are not going to be the same. So this, um, I've got a mouse, yes. So these uh, soil samples, for example, are all taken from the same vineyard, showing just sort of variability in one of the key drivers that affects crop crop yield or quality and so on. So our work is trying to understand the variability in the land at the scale of individual paddocks or blocks or vineyards. Um, and using a better understanding that variability, we can provide uh, assistance for people to manage their inputs. It might be fertiliser or irrigation or selectively um, target outputs you harvesting into different product streams and that sort of thing. So it's coming down to improving management for profitability and sustainability. So where do we work? We um, work quite a lot in grapes where people are interested in yield and, and quality. A bit hard to see on that slide, but that um, harvester there's got a GPS on it. It's got a, a load cell on the, X, on the uh, elevator that's, that's weighing the, the grapes as they come off. It's got a fluorescence sensor over the grapes that's actually trying to um, assess grape quality. Um, so we can, from that, generate maps uh, of, of um, yield, obviously, and, and trying, trying to do maps of quality. Um, we work in sugar, so again, interested in yield, um, the sugar content of the crop, how that varies, um, and also work on fertiliser use and you know, trying to um, optimise fertiliser use to uh, reduce runoff of unnecessary fertiliser and expense, I guess. Uh, and broad apiary grains, again, interested in yields and, and some, in some cases protein. So yield maps are a big part of what we do, but there's a lot of other bits and pieces. Um, so our GIS in precision viticulture, um, we're reliant on spatially referenced data, and so GIS is quite central to what we do. Um, we work with a number of different sensors, so that's yield monitors, EM38, we map soil conductivity, gamma radiometrics, but then we also use airborne imagery, um, as well as proximally sensed uh, crop spectra, that sort of stuff to generate NDVIs and so on. Uh, we use elevation maps, so it might be uh, we, we do our own uh, RTK grade survey, so we're affected by this um, uh, datum issue. Um, and we might do targeted sampling of crops and soils um, in, within the blocks that we're working in. So just to illustrate that, so uh, in one case we're doing targeted soil sampling, so we use GIS to, and, and additional uh, data layers to plan where we should to target soil sampling to sort of optimally soil uh, sample. We do a lot of on-the-go work, so we've got point trails of a sensor or a, um, you know, GPS elevations and that sort of stuff at, at one second or three second intervals or certain distances. And then there's the rasters and images. Um, and a lot of our work uh, involves taking the, the sort of on-the-go data that we get from harvesters and so on and turning that into rasters which are much more friendly for analysis and that sort of stuff. Um, so GIS in, is quite central to what we're doing, but we have a lot of other tools, spreadsheets, uh, GPS data manipulation, um, yield processing, we use Krigging to, to interpolate, um, topographic and terrain indices are important, um, specialised geospatial analyses and that sort of stuff. So we're moving data in and out of GIS. So and up until just recently we've been using ArcGIS almost exclusively, um, but we're, we're moving forward. Um, over the number of years, I've developed a, a whole suite of, uh, initially they were VBA tools for, for ArcGIS and then migrated to Python tools, and then more recently, Python scripts that use open source uh, geospatial libraries. So these workflows 
help us get through our work more quickly and standardise the application of various protocols and, and standards, um, as well as some of the analysis that goes on afterwards. This um, single image from, I meant to acknowledge Rob Bramley, who's the project leader, um, uh, who is you know, sort of managing a lot of this work. Um, this is one of his images. This kind of summarises the work we do. So this is a single vineyard block in northwestern Victoria. Um, we've got two years of PCD, which is an airborne imagery of um, plant cell density or near infrared and red. Um, we've got two years of yield maps. We've got an EM, uh, so it's a soil conductivity survey, and that's all draped over an elevation. And then we use a statistical clustering called k-means clustering. Um, and that's used to delineate these different zones, which then the, the uh, grower or the manager could use that to, uh, say, selectively harvest from different parts of the block to go into different product streams or manage the irrigation differently or manage the um, fertilisation or whatever they do. Um, so that's kind of the, the package of what we do. So we've got these tools, we've got these protocols, but people are not picking it up and using it. So we, many years ago, we realised that one of the big problems was that the GIS tool that we're using, ArcGIS, is way too expensive for growers and even farm consultants to use. Um, and so there's been six, a project recently <coughs> funded, sponsored by Wine Australia, but it's come through the um, Rural R&D for Profit program, Australian government. Um, and while this is sort of a vineyard focus in this work, um, the tools that will, will come out of this um, will be applicable to other cropping systems, sugar and, and uh, grains as well. And this is where I'll hand over to Christina who will talk about the next bit of the work. So one of the first um, tasks was to actually decide on which uh, free open source GIS package we'd use. There are lots out there on the market and uh, we had to um, be able to pick one that would be able to fulfil all these uh, needs that we have. So um, after doing some quick uh, internet searches, we found that you know there are lots of web-based one um, GIS packages, uh, cloud services, all that sort of thing. So we had to um, try and narrow it down to exactly what uh, was required. So um, this is, I suppose, a list of what. Uh, we determined so we wanted a general purpose GIS um, desktop in the first instance application. Um, as you've seen um, from what David's presented, we need to be able to support uh, both raster and vector for editing and um, visualisation and analysis. Um, we, because there's a set of tools already written, uh, we need to be able to migrate and uh, use them in whatever the selected software. Um, and in the sh short term, we're restricted to a Windows environment, but in the long term, it'd be nice to be able to um, make use of other operating environments like your Macs and things. Uh, so after that, um, after working out um, some GIS packages, we came up with a, a list of criteria that we wanted to be able to um, investigate um, for each of the packages and have an idea of um, narrow it down even more to be able to uh, do some actual testing of the software. So these are the, um, the different categories. So currency, we wanted something that was mature in development, um, has regular releases to users so that we can stay up to date. It had to be a general purpose GIS. Um, but still had the ability to be able to integrate or expand to other specialised tools and functionality. Has to be able to support a wide range of raster and vector formats. Um, the development platform will uh, influence how readily other developers uh, might pick up some of our tools and our plugins and maybe enhance them. Being able to pick up other suites of um, tools like the Saga and the Grass tools that you may or may not have seen currently in QGIS. Um, as the majority of the tools are already written in Python, uh, we preferred a software package that would also be able to interact with Python so we wouldn't need to learn a new language um, to be able to uh, provide the tools. And very importantly, um, the online support community and resources that were available. We wanted something where if we got stuck, we could post something online and get a, a, an answer pretty quickly 
um, or to be able to Google how to do a, a particular task. So the initial candidates, there's 14 up there. Um, we went through and categorised and made notes on each of those seven criteria against all of those candidates um, and then produced a short list of three. So for each of those three uh, options, we went through and took them through some of the similar workflows that uh, it's that are familiar within the uh, precision agriculture. Um, so it includes things like being able to produce maps with multiple um, side by sides so that could be two different uh, yields or two different imagery and um, elevation or something like that, or even as shown in that picture, just a simple location map. Where are we in Australia? Um, we had to be able to have basic cartography, including labelling, adding of legends, scale bars, text boxes, titles, logos, all that sort of thing. Projecting data. Uh, some of the data sets come from all over Australia, so to be able to convert between um, different GDA zones um, was important. Being able to stylise the data based on the protocols that have been set up. They're very strict on the colours used. So we needed to be able to um, create custom colour ramps and apply that to the data sets. And in addition to that, just all the general GIS -y, um, operations, buffering, clipping, all that sort of thing. So the, from those three shortlisted candidates, so GRASP is very powerful for analysing rest of data sets. Um, unfortunately, you have to be able to convert everything into a native grass format um, for processing efficiencies. They do provide tools to do that importing, but we thought that was a bit of a, a limitation. And oh, another limitation was that cartographic capability was a lot more difficult to be able to reproduce that map in grass. Second one we um, looked at was Saga. Once again, has a lot of tools for analysing and processing data. It also uses its own native data format, provides the tools to reproject and get data into that format. Um, but we've also found that the cartographic display was even more limited than GRASS. So the third and the winner was QGIS. It was a really good, well-rounded, out-of-the-box solution. Um, supports all the, the data sets and formats that we required. It could consume web services as well for imagery, backdrops and things. Um, it has an extensive online community. If you um, need to Google on how to do something, it was pretty, pretty easy to find your answer. There's, as you've been shown, there are a lot of plugins, toolboxes. It has a central repository for processing tools and plugins. Um, it also had access to other third-party um, plugins and toolboxes like the GDAL toolbox, Grass Saga, which would then bring all those specialised tools that I um, mentioned in the previous uh, software in, into QGIS and to be able to make use of some of the specialised functionality. So challenges we faced, the, Q, the QGIS licence um, was one of the big impacts. We wanted our tools to be adopted not only by novice GIS users and research, but also software developers. So the people manufacturing those yield monitors on the actual tractors to be able to maybe incorporate our tools into their um, own software or web services. So that led to us creating our own custom Python package, which we've called PyPrecAg short for precision agriculture, <laughs> to contain the core processing steps. Then we're using QGIS plugin to then provide the user interface, the help documentation, the, the cartography and the map displays um, that comes with it. This, however, has caused issues. So things like buffering, we're not using the QGIS functionality. We've had to develop our own um, and use other geospatial Python packages. We've also had issues with file encoding, things like scientific notation. There's the one that's shown there, degrees Celsius is another one. Um, loading those data sets in from CSV files mainly can cause problems. QGIS is handling them very well, so we've managed to get around some of those through the delimited text um, tool that's currently in QGIS. We've also had some um, funny things happen with, with projections. 
in that depending on how the different Python packages read the different PROJ4 strings and various different ways of expressing them, found that sometimes GDA 94, GDA 2020, and the zonal um, WGS84 projections, just in their word descriptions, were getting mixed up, especially if the EPSG numbers weren't in the, the um, projection files. Um, so because we are building our own Python package, um, we have, we try to use the core Python packages um, as a starting point. We'll try and work out what we're doing with those first, and then if it fails, we'll use other non-QGIS Python packages, like GeoPandas, Raster.io, and Unidecode. So GeoPandas um, works with vector files and Panda data sets, data frames. Uh, Raster.io, same sort of thing, but with um, the raster files. And the Unidico was a, a nice find which actually dealt with some of the, uh, the scientific notations. It actually has shown there, it'll take the degrees Celsius into the word deg C. So that was a, a nice useful one. We could run a CSV file through that, change the field names before we actually bring it into some of the processes. What we've achieved through our process, and we're still, we're sort of halfway through the development at the moment, we've set up an in-house development environment. Um, CSIRO uses Bitbucket and Jira, and we've also found PyCharm to be very useful too. We've successfully uh, developed a QGIS plugin with a few tools in it, and we've managed to link some of the Python um, logging package into the QGIS function so we can make use of the logging panel and writing um, to file what's happening is a little example shown there, you probably can't read it. But we've also implemented some uh, GUI tool validation. So this is a form um, that you enter the information to run the tools. Some of these descriptors and things are quite specific about the range of numbers. Um, we're trying to output everything in a projected coordinate system, not a geographic coordinate system. So this just enabled us to be able to control the options that people were choosing and to be able to validate it prior to um, clicking OK rather than getting halfway through the process and having to go back and fill in the forms again. Um, we're using the QGIS layers, the spreadsheet um, layer plugin and the delimited text um, layers to get data into QGIS. And these have actually made it a lot easier because we can take in other formats as well, like um, text files, tab files, with a three or four row header before you get to the field names, and QGIS handles it quite nicely. So being able to use these to then feed into um, the PyPrec AG side of the, the tools was actually quite useful. So as I've said, we've um, created a, a plugin, comes with a menu, we've got a few small um, user preferences, mainly where the data's coming from and where it's going to in the first instance. We have successfully migrated three tools. First one is a GPS point trail to a polygon, which is required for the, some of the processing steps later on. Converting that to a customised raster CSV format. And also being able to um, clean the CSV or the yield monitor data to remove um, values between a certain ranges to remove outliers, reproject it so that the coordinates in the text files are in the coordinate system um, of the, the raster, the block grid output. And so what's next? Uh, converting the, the last um, two square, squarish blocks there. So the Vespa command is all to do with um, quigging of data. That's a Windows executable at the moment, so that's why we're stuck with using um, Windows QGIS, but that in the long term we'll look at migrating that using some of the tools out of Saga or Grass or um, other processes. Uh, we'd also like to create a workflow wizard so the target audience can be anyone from a farmer who doesn't really know GIS through to a researcher who will want to tinker with some of the values and settings within the tool. So the workflow process will be for the farmer, for example, and, it, and the processing toolbox and the individual buttons on the toolbar will be for researchers and um, the people that want to be able to control some of the processing steps. We're looking into different ways to provide detailed tool help. Um, 
and also later on down the track doing some cartographic representations so how to symbolise the data using our standard protocols, what standard templates we can make available. What's next? We know DDA 2020 is coming up, so um, we're not quite sure how we're going to handle it with some of our processing yet, because we are talking um, you know, down to the sub-meter um, for some of the points in the data we are collecting. We have to create a PIP install for PyProcag and actually work out um, the best way to roll that out with the plug-in and get it installed again, um, with QGIS. Um, once that's done, we can deploy it to the QGIS um, repository of plugins that we can then get people to start doing beta testing. Um, we'd like to somehow be able to connect some of the um, you know, percent processed progress status that we can generate through a Pi package and somehow get that talking to QGIS. I'm not quite sure how to do that yet, but um, it's on the list of things to look at. And the other big one is the migration to QGIS 3 and Python 3. And if anyone's got any suggestions on directions or how we might achieve some of that, um, we'd be quite happy to talk. And is there any questions? Just a quick question. So the hardware side, you're using proprietary hardware to do data collection for all of your weights and whatever. So that's what I, I took from that. Is there a move to go for more of an open hardware These capabilities can buy sensors for three bucks now. You can do all that. Have you got a longer term view to simplify that side so you can drop the cost to participate? Because that's the bit I see as the expensive part. You've brought down and you've made the software accessible, but now the hardware is the costly mm -hmm. part. That if you're not generating much revenue, it's really going to hamper you and it'll be a barrier of entry. So that's a, it's a really good question and it's really complex area, so we're not actually developing the hardware or the logger, mm. so we kind of use what you know, we get off the shelf in some of our stuff, we're just using um, apps that run on Windows, um, but the yield monitors are proprietary hardware, like you say, um, different sensors come with their own, either logging their own software or, or hardware that does the logging, so it's kind of out of our control, but we kind of often get down to the CSV file as the lowest common denominator, and that's where we have to handle so we're not, because we're not developing the sensors ourselves, we're kind of stuck there. and it's up to industry really to to get that right. Yeah. But then I can provide my own sensors and use your analysis there yeah. after I think that. <coughs> yep. I can see quite a deal of usage I can get out of that. So that's true. Good. Then I'll be next one. Okay. Um, so one of the things I've, I've been in the industry for 10 odd years and, and one of the things I've seen when talking in particular with government agencies and CSIRO close to that, um, is that government agencies have a tendency to want to do everything in-house. Um, the, the way that you solve the problem is you say, I'll get budget, I'll then go solve it myself. And one of the things that, that really makes an open source project is when you're able to go out and track in. Is that, have you thought about that? Uh, look, that's again a, a point I picked up from your talk and that's part of the reason we're here today, because um, we are a bit we're a very small team um, and kind of isolated and so the more we can connect, um, we want to produce, you know, the open source idea is um, what we're working towards. So um, I think the more we could work out ways of collaborating and so on, the better we're going to do. Because, like you say, we've got a project that's funded for three years after that, who knows? So, so David, um, over the past how many years, years. has mm -hmm. developed like the baseline um, code, starting from obviously the VB going through into ArcGIS and in Python, and then to open source geospatial libraries. So I'm taking a lot of that work that he's done and migrating it into what you've seen as PyProcag and the QGIS plugin. So. So it's a small team. <laughs> <laughs> Big challenge, small team. <laughs>
Yep. I was doing my PhD, I did some tweet analysis and stuff, and I had a little monitor that and I used Genius for all of that. So yeah, it's not that hard. That's good. Yeah, it's, good it's good to hear. We've got um, <laughs> our, our um, protocol um, at the moment sort of sort of states that we use block prigging and local very grand prigging and so on. So yeah. um, it's actually quite tricky to find prigging software or libraries that actually do that sort of thing. So, but, yeah, but, but that's um, one thing certainly yeah. worth looking at. Yeah. You can compare, you can do both and then the yeah. yeah, and if they don't look very different, well, that's good enough, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. 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 Cool. So, if there's no more questions, thanks very much for that.